بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه تسليما السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى بركاته I pray that everybody is doing well. It's my first time at the ICNA Mass Convention and just wanted to give a shout out to the organizers, the volunteers, everybody here. May Allah Ta'ala accept and facilitate the best experience this year and beyond. Ameen Ya Rab. So my topic is the topic of marriage and this idea of a triangulation, if you will, that the marital relationship in Islam, it always goes back to the fact that you've got the husband and wife uniting on the basis of the guidance in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam. As I was thinking about that, I was thinking about companionship and there are really three hadiths that came to mind that I wanted to share. The, the first hadith is one that you might not think about immediately when we discuss marriage in Islam. And that first hadith is the hadith of Khalwa. And this is the very famous teaching of the Prophet والسلام, that reminder that's often a painful reminder given our culture and certain realities, but this reminder that when an unrelated non-mahram male and female are together in isolation that shaitan is the third. So that's one hadith I was thinking about. The next hadith was the hadith of friendship. Al-mar'u ala dini khalilih, that a person is upon the religion of his, of his companion to let him be careful about the person that he or she befriends. So that's again one hadith, then two, Here's a third one. Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu said that the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that destruction is in the desire for gold and silver. So Umar said, O messenger of God, what kind of wealth, i.e. if gold and silver, if that desire for that is destructive, what kind of wealth should we seek? So the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, a tongue of remembrance, a grateful heart, and a believing wife. Again, a tongue of remembrance, a grateful heart, and a believing wife. So we have three different hadiths that seem quite disparate. How do we put those hadiths together in terms of how we think about marriage in Islam? Let's do that. If you think about it, all of these hadiths, when you look at them collectively, they are about number one, companionship. Whether it might be that unlawful companionship that ensues when the unrelated people are in a solitary kind of setting. So again, all these hadiths are about number one, companionship. Number two, the choices that we make in life. And number three, the very important need of human beings for psychological fulfillment and emotional validation. So in that first hadith, again, we have a very common scenario of a male and female meeting each other alone and shaitan coming in and taking advantage of that natural attraction between the male and female. So that's the first hadith. In the second hadith, we are told that choice matters. Choice is not neutral that our friends, whether we are cognizant of this reality or not, will affect our religious practice, our understanding, even our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the third hadith, we learn about destructive desires, i.e. materialism, and how we should seek fulfillment, not in hoarding up wealth, but instead we seek fulfillment and that emotional validation through remembrance of God, dhikrillah, through gratitude, a grateful heart, and through a righteous spouse. 
So when you put these hadiths together, you come to understand that the human being, dear sisters and dear brothers, is never alone. That we are always surrounded by elements of al of alam al ghayb, the world of the unseen. And we have the ability, and let's, let's listen closely to this and think about it, that we have the ability, by virtue of our actions and choices, to either attract to us shaitanic elements or angelic elements. Think about the hadith of the Prophet. I'll give you another hadith. This is hadith 36 in Imam uh, Nawawi's collection, the Arba'in, the 40 hadiths. وَمَا اجْتَمَعَ قَوْمٌ فِي بَيْتٍ مِنْ بُيُوتِ اللَّهِ يَتْلُونَ كِتَابَ اللَّهِ وَيَتَدَارَسُونَهُ بَيْنَهُمْ إِلَّا نَزَلَتْ عَلَيْهُمُ السَّكِينَةِ وَغَشْيَتْهُمُ الرَّحْمَةِ وَحَفَّتْهُمُ الْمَلَائِكَةِ so here's an example of inviting that angelic presence by the choices that we make, by our actions. In this case, in this particular hadith, the Prophet says, peace be upon him, that no single group of people gathers together in a house for amongst the houses of Allah, i.e. the Masajid, reciting Quran and studying it amongst themselves, except that, نَزَلَتْ عَلَيْهِمُ sakina that tranquility descends on them. وَغَشْيَتْهُمُ rahma And mercy envelops them. وَحَفَّتْهُمُ malaika And the angels surround them. And Allah Ta'ala remembers them amongst those in His assembly. Azza wa Jal. So think about that. That by our actions, we are, we are either inviting angelic presence or something very different. Now, to the issue of marriage. When you look at the Qur'an, dear brothers and dear sisters, I want you to keep in mind that one of the primary examples that's given in the Qur'an around the issue of marital discord is actually this ayah that I'm going to share right now. This to me is really, it's illustrative because it tells us something about the connection between marital discord and that spiritual context. So here's the ayah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. وَاتَّبَعُوا مَا تَتْلُوا الشَّيَاطِينُ مَا تَتْلُوا الشَّيَاطِينُ عَلَى مُلْكِ سُلَيْمَانِ Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. وَاتَّبَعُوا مَا تَتْلُوا الشَّيَاطِينُ عَلَى مُلْكِ سُلَيْمَانِ وَمَا كَفَرَ سُلَيْمَانِ وَلَكِنَّ الشَّيَاطِينَ كَفَرُوا يُعَلِّمُونَ النَّاسَ السِّحْرَ وَمَا أُنْزِلْ عَلَى الْمَلَكِينَ بِبَابِلَ هَارُوتَ وَمَا رُوتَ وَمَا يُعَلِّمَانَ مِنْ أَحَدٍ حَتَّى يَقُولَ إِنَّمَا نَحْنُ فِتْنَةٌ فَلَا تَكْفُرْ فَيَتَعَلَّمُونَ مِنْهُمَا مَا يُفَرِّقُونَ بِهِ بَيْنَ الْمَرْءِ وَزَوْجِهِ So this is the ayah. Again, this is uh, Surah Al-Baqarah. This is verse 102. So the mis one of the mistakes of the people at that time is that they were uh, uh, basically, uh, they were... Um, uh, following that which the evil ones used to practice during Suleiman's time. But it was not Suleiman who denied the truth, but it was those evil ones who denied it, the shayateen. By doing what? By teaching people sihr, sorcery. And not in some really sort of impractical sense. Let's see what the ayah says. And they follow that which has come down through the two angels in Babylon, Harut and Marut, although these two never taught it to anyone without first declaring, we are but a temptation, a fitna, temptation to evil. Do not then deny God's truth. And they learn from these two how to do what? How to create discord between a man and his wife. But whereas they can harm none, thereby save by God's leave, they acquire a knowledge that only harms themselves and does not benefit them. So what do we take from this ayah? We learn that in married life, and especially when it comes to marital discord, there is that connection to the world of the unseen. And again, that's why I want us to ponder these ahadith and think about the way that marriage is impacted by cho the choices we make, our actions. The, that presence that we invite into our lives. You know, the Prophet ﷺ very famously reminded us of one of the main purposes of marriage. And this is the hadith that when a person marries, they have fulfilled half of their religion. 
So let them fear Allah regarding the remaining half. It's a very famous narration. This one is from Bayhaqi. And a lot of us look at this hadith in sort of a very surface way, thinking that once we've gotten married and sort of gotten that out of the way, that we don't really have to worry about a lot after that. That half of our entire iman is taken care of in that. But the reality, dear brothers and dear sisters, is that by marrying, that the husband and wife have certainly followed the sunnah outwardly. But inwardly, they still have a lot of work to do. So when we look at this hadith, we don't look at this hadith thinking that we can be comfortable or complacent. It means we actually have to work very hard. Because we have now utilized certain arzaq blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. And how then do we show gratitude for those blessings? We should ask ourselves, will this marriage be spiritual or transactional? Will this marriage be used as a means to draw closer to Allah or further away? Will this marriage be a venue, a grand opportunity to conduct ourselves with excellence, with ihsan, or something very, very different from that? Think about the famous ayah that we see on every single wedding invitation. And of his signs is that he created literally for you from amongst yourselves as waj, these perfect partners, mates, spouses, that you may find tranquility in them. And he placed between you affection and mercy, indeed, and that are signs for a people who give thought. You know, if, I'll be very, very frank. In the realm of education and counsel, religious counseling and da'wah and the work that I do, if I had, I don't know, a dollar, five dollars for every time someone came to me with a question, a concern, a complaint about marriage, I would be a millionaire. That's the reality. And it is a sad reality. When we look at the statistics, when we look at sort of the soaring divorce, divorce rate in the Muslim community, what I'm finding time and time again is that we are making the mistake of overlooking some of the most beautiful blessings right in front of us. I'm seeing marriages that are being impacted by restlessness, by ingratitude. The sakina, the tranquility, the comfort, the love, the affection, the mercy, those things are non-existent. And least we shrug our shoulders and think that we can take this person for granted and they have to be tolerant of the things that we heap upon them, let's remember this point here, dear sisters and dear brothers. When we look at Quranic language and the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the marital covenant, the term mithaq is used. And this is a word that recurs in the Quran about 30 times in different forms. And let's understand this, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses this term mithaq, binding covenant, with respect to the children of Israel, i.e. that's how significant this is, and with respect to marriage. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. So the next time, and this is my nasiha, sincere nasiha to all of us here, the next time we are tempted to invite a presence into our homes and lives that is not angelic, the next time we want to succumb to anger and grievance, the next time we find ourselves being inclined to committing acts of oppression against that person closest to us, let's think about the fact that Allah Ta'ala describes this marriage as mithaqan ghalidha. It is nothing to be taken lightly. Finally, let me end with this reminder. How does Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala characterize that marital relationship? I think this description alone is sufficient. 
هُنَّ لِبَاسُ لَكُمْ وَأَنْتُمْ لِبَاسُ لَهُنْ لِبَاس Garments that provide protection, safety, security, beauty, adornment, psychological fulfillment, emotional validation, love and support. Let's ask ourselves, are we following that paradigm? Because that's the paradigm that takes us to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it elevates that love to a love that is heavenly. Or is it the opposite? We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to strengthen the marriages of everybody here. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reconcile any differences you might have with your spouse. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless our community to model marriages that are predicated on a pure love for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Jazakumullah khaira. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh.